Good morning, Orange You. Welcome, everyone. Jesus, speaking to the woman at the well, said this, A time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Will you join with me as we try our best to worship the Father in spirit and in truth? me, we will glorify the King of kings, we will glorify the Lamb, we will glorify the Lord of lords, who is the great I Am. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth, He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to Him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of lords, who is the great I Am. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemy. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will wait upon the Lord. He will fill me with new strength. I will fly with wings like an eagle. The Lord liveth. And blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord. Well, good morning, everyone. So thanks so much for coming out to be with us on this first day of the week as we've assembled together to worship God. We're going to finish up our series that we've got on uh, vision that we have going on, and we're going to take a look more again at being lights in the world. So in Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippian church and said, "...do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you might be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, and then this, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation." among whom you shine as lights in the world. So we spent uh, the month of April largely talking about developing a vision and working towards a unified goal for accomplishing God's will in the world. And everybody wants to know, what's my role in that? Well, today I, I hope to put some flesh on those bones, so to speak. So I'll get real specific as to kind of what I'm kind of seeing. Uh, you may differ. It's my view. Uh, you're welcome to develop your view. We'll kind of hammer those out together and we'll get a congregational goal of where we're headed and we'll be off and running and hope to see God doing some exciting things with us. So uh, this morning as we per engage in our worship though one thing that we're going to do of course is the lord's supper here in about 15 or 20 minutes so you'll need a communion kit for that it might be like the one here i got in my hand you get these right as the coming in the main door or it might be like the one that's there on the screen but you are going to need one so if you have not yet gotten one of these go ahead and excuse yourself to grab one either in the back of the auditorium or at the main entrance coming in and uh, then we'll cue you for that here in just a bit but we're going to go ahead now and have our opening prayer and then we'll be right back into our song service Please bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful Lord's Day that you've given to us. We thank you that we can come here and worship you together as a family, as a local congregation, that we can read a portion of your word, we can hear a portion of your word, we can sing songs of praise to you, we can pray to you, we can ask you to watch over us. We thank you for all those who work in this church who help keep it functioning, the elders overseeing what goes on here, the deacons and the teachers and the others who help keep the church functioning, 
keep the children educated, to lift each other up, to edify each other, to be there as friends and family to each other. We ask that you bless this church, give each member who's willing and able a ministry that can be salt and light to the world around them, wherever they might find themselves, that we might grow your church, that we might glorify you, that we might find others to come to you to ultimately have a home in heaven with you. We thank you for all you've blessed us with. We thank you for our children. We thank you for those that we come in contact with that we can call our friends. Help us to edify them and to open our hearts and minds and learn from them as well, whether it's teaching us a lesson or helping us to soften our heart to problems they might have in their lives. <clears throat> we ask that you be with us throughout this worship. We hope that it honors you, glorifies you. We ask you to forgive us of our sins as we ask for forgiveness. We want to thank you for the fact that we can be here unobstructed in a country that still allows free worship so that we can seek you in a public place as a, as a gathered group. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I sing praises to your name, O Lord, praises to your name, O Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I sing praises to your name, O Lord, praises to your name. O oh Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I give glory to your name. O oh Lord, glory to your name. O oh Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I give glory to your name, O oh Lord, glory to your name, O oh Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. No, so me. You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depth of your love? You are beautiful beyond description, majesty enthroned above. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in awe of you. Stand, um, sorry. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot 
fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail by the living word of God shall prevail standing on the promises of God standing 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 on the promises of God my Savior standing standing I'm standing on the promises of God stand up stand up for Jesus ye soldiers of the cross lift high his royal banner it must not suffer loss from victory unto victory his army shall he lead till every foe is vanquished for christ is lord indeed stand up stand up for Jesus the strife will not be long this noise the noise of battle the next the victor song to him that overcometh a crown of life shall be he with the king of glory shall reign he Eternally. Please be seated. This next song, Glorious Day, um, was made popular by Casting Crowns about you know, 10 years ago or so. Um, we've sung it before, but it's been, uh, it's been a few years since we have done it. And you might recognize the lyrics of this song from another song that's in our songbook, One Day. But I want to kind of re re resurrect this song, as Mark Hall tried to do. Um, but it has a different melody, so I want you to uh, pay attention to that. Uh, he brought it to life for a new generation. I'm going to let Mark talk to you about it. The song Glorious Day is a big song for me. It has been my whole life because I, I grew up anything but the hymnal till college. As a matter of fact, I went to, to Bible college, and they said, do you sing praise choruses? And I thought, I mean like the chorus to a hymn? I didn't know any of that stuff was. And, and Glorious Day was one of those that I always liked because as a kid, if you knew the song, you knew the gospel. So you could just sing the song and you got it. And, uh, but sometimes being a youth pastor, music shifts culturally and songs get lost. And I think this is one of them. So I started writing the song and, uh, and then heard another version that Michael Bleeker uh, had written and and so what you've got is you've got his verse and you've got my courses and channel we just sort of brought them together and I, I, I believe it sort of relaunched the song uh, a song that got lost for a while in the church what I like about glorious day is the same thing I like about who am I if you're driving in the car and you turn on the radio uh, some songs would make more sense if you're a believer uh, but a song like Who Am I just says this is who God is and he loves you and this is the gospel and what I like I love about glorious glorious what I love about Glorious Day is that it's the gospel in the song. Somebody's driving down the road, they turn it on, there it is from beginning to end. Gospel in a song, I like that. No, so me. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. The Word became flesh, and the light shone among us, His glory revealed. Living He loved me, dying He saved me, buried He carried my sins far away, rising He justified freely forever. One day He's coming, O oh, glorious day. Oh, glorious day, 
One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on a tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected. Bearing our sin, my Redeemer is He. The hands that healed nations stretched out on a tree and took the nails from me. Living, He loved me. Dying, He saved me. Buried, He carried my sins far away. Rising, He justified freely forever. One day He's coming, O oh, glorious day, O oh, glorious day. One day the grave could conceal Him no longer. One day the stone rolled away from the door. Then He arose over death He had conquered. Now is ascended, my Lord, evermore. Death could not hold Him. The grave could not keep Him from rising again. Living He loved me. Dying He saved me. Buried He carried my sins far away. Rising He justified freely forever. One day He's coming, O oh, glorious day, O oh, glorious day. O oh, glorious day, O oh, glorious day. In 1 Thessalonians 4, it talks about a glorious day. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of a command and with the voice of an archangel and at the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive that lucky generation, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we always will be with the Lord. What a glorious day that will be. But until that day comes, we're going to eat and drink the bread and proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. The song before the Lord's Supper. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but lost and pour contempt on Oh, my pride, God is so good, God is so good, God is so good, He's so good to me. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my Lord. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to His blood. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good, He's so good to me. See from His head, His hands, His feet, sorrow and love flowed mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet or thorns compose so rich a crown god is so good 
God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. Well, when we come together on the first day of the week, one of the things that we do is we partake of communion, which is the time in which we remember what happened in our uh, Savior's death and how it is that that obtains for us salvation from sin. And when you deal with uh, this subject, sometimes people will raise the objection and they'll say, it just seems like that is just too good to be true, uh, that someone else could die in, con- in consequence for my sin so that I can be forgiven based on what he has done. And we even have this adage in our culture that if something seems too good to be true, it, it probably is. We make movies about it. In the, in the mid-1990s, there was a, a movie when cloning first started coming out called Multiplicity. And in Multiplicity, this guy, played by Michael Keaton, he thought that he's just got too much going on in his life and he needed some help managing it all. He had his, his family life and his work life and his recreational life and he, he wanted to have some time to himself. And so he came up one day and he thought, you know, if there were just more of me then things would be better. And so he uses cloning to make multiples of himself, and then he assigns one to his family life, one to his work life, one to his recreational life, and so on like that. And then he spent the whole movie trying to just keep those clones from wrecking his life because he discovered, sure enough, if it was too good to be true, it it was. It didn't work out for him. And so then when we see this idea about salvation, people kind of remember things like that. Yeah, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Because the consequences of sin and the spiritual reality in which we live does indeed look pretty dire. Romans 14 tells us that we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. That day is coming. Yet the Scriptures also tell us that Christ has delivered us, those of us who are children of God, from the domain of darkness and into the kingdom of His beloved Son, and then this, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. And that's based on what Christ has done. And so we look at what it is that Christ has done in dying on our behalf so that we can be saved. And again, it just seems incredible. But the Scriptures are clear that Christ is indeed um, the author of salvation to all who obey Him. And we are slaves of whom we choose to obey, either a slave of sin to death or of obedience to righteousness. But the choice is ours. If we cast our allegiance with sin, the end result of that is awful. Because Romans 6 is clear. The wages of sin is death. But then comes that part that just sounds too good to be true. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So here we are 2,000 years after the crucifixion event. And we look back and we see that Christ died on our behalf. And we remember what it is that Jesus said when he said, this is my body that's broken for you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you in order that we might obtain the forgiveness of sins. So again, Hebrews 5 is direct that Jesus became the author or the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. And this is true. This is possible because of that obedience and that way in which he suffered and died on our behalf. So when we come together here on the first day of the week to partake of the Lord's Supper, as we are now, this is the time to kind of remember that, wow, it is an incredible thing that we can stand in confidence before God, knowing that we'll be accepted by him because the consequences of our sin were paid for in his death on the cross those years ago. Go ahead and take your communion kit, if you would, and open it up. And you've got two things in there. You have some unleavened bread. That's a small little piece of bread. And then you have some fruit of the vine in a little cup. And this is an object lesson that Jesus gave to help us remember this event. So go ahead and take the bread first. And then what we'll do is we'll offer a prayer for the bread. and We'll all take together. And then we'll do the same for the fruit of the vine. Okay, let's, let's pray together. Lord, we give you thanks for this bread to which Christ said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And we pray, Lord, that as we take this now, that we would do so in a way that's acceptable and pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
Take your bread. Okay, go ahead and take your fruit of the vine now, if you would, and open that up. And as with the bread, we'll offer a prayer, and then we'll all take together. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks for this fruit of the vine to which Christ said, This is the blood of the new covenant that's shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And we pray, Lord, that as we take of this now, that we would do so in a way that's pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. 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 She Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, blessing again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. Gee, when I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus. Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Worthy is your name worthy is your name well, one of the ways in which we also worship god is through our financial giving um, and so it's a way in which we show our thanks to god for the ability to obtain wealth that he has given to us so we don't pass collection plates, although that's traditionally done in churches, but we've moved to a different direction, and now nearly all of our giving is done online. Not all of it, but much of it is. So if you'd like to make a contribution online, the way that giving is done there is two ways. So one, you can text the word GIVE to the number on the screen, 714-450-7010, and that will bounce back to your phone, the guidance on doing that. The other way that you can do that is you can go to the congregation's webpage at followthebible.com and click the button there on the page that says click here for online giving and it will go through that same process. Now if you're here on the church campus today, uh, you can give a tangible gift here uh, through one of the collection boxes that are at the exit points out of the auditorium. And then uh, some of our members are not able to attend in person, they're only able to attend by our live stream or recorded service and they elect to give by mail, that's another option as well. 
and the address for the congregation is there on the screen. It's 13211 Fairview Street, Garden Grove, California, 92843. So this brings us to the point of our service, where in just a moment, we're going to have a brief break. Um, during this break period, we'll have a variety of things that are going on. So let me kind of guide you through them. Now, there'll be some uh, not normal stuff going on today, so I'll give you a, a cue on that one as well. So one thing that's going to go on is you can meet and greet one another. That's our normal uh, routine. So you're welcome to get up from the auditorium and walk around and chat with one another. That would be fine. Uh, while this break's going on, we'll have a five-minute timer that'll count down for us. So kind of keep an eye on that. Uh, while you're doing that, I'll be up here in the front with a couple things of my own. So one of the things that I'll be doing is uh, distributing the kids pack. So that's the instructional packet for the people that are uh, more inclined to, to learn by activity. So coloring, crossword puzzles, word finds, things like that. So I'll be up here in the front distributing those. Now here's the atypical one. So next week, um, our new preacher, Kevin Williams, will be here. And so to welcome him in, we have a congregational meal scheduled. So during that uh, time, we would appreciate it, if you would, to sign up on our potluck list as to what it is that you're going to bring and participate in that. And to do that, we have a little sign-up deal. So you can either use the little QR symbol that's there on the screen, and that'll take you to the webpage to sign up on it. But I'll also be up here in the front with the analog sheet. So if you want to come up and sign up for something, you're welcome to do that as well. So I'll be up in the front uh, doing that too. Um, and then also, another thing that I'll have up here are the weekly bulletins. So if you want a print copy of the bulletin, you can come up and retrieve one of those from me as well. Or you can text the word OV Weekly, one big word, to that 94,000 number, and it will bounce that back to you. And then just in case you didn't have enough options of things to do during the break, you can also send a card to anyone if you would like to do that. So that's out in the lobby as well. But we'll go ahead and start our timer now, and we'll see you all back in five minutes. Thanks so much. I feel like I should sing that song. <laughs> Amazing Grace, this is a song uh, that uh, Chris Tomlin kind of re rewrote a little bit. It's got a different uh, chorus to it. <clears throat> Great song. And oh, so amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear The hour I first believed My chains are gone I've been set free My God, my Savior Has ransomed me And like a flood his mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The earth will soon dissolve like snow, the sun forbear to shine. But God who called me here below will be forever mine my chains are gone i've been set free my god my savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns Unending love, amazing grace, 
my chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace, Unending love, amazing grace. If you'd like to turn your Bibles over to Philippians chapter 2, uh, we're going to read our first text there to get our general theme, and then we're going to go through and finish up our discussion on vision. So here's what the Apostle Paul said. He said, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, and here's the reason for that, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, and here's the context of that, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, and here's our role in that, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Okay, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to be your people here in the world and recognize that while we're here, we have a task and a job. In the Sermon on the Mount, you indicated to us that we were the light of the world, we were the salt of the earth. You gave the great commission in the close of Matthew's gospel to go into the world and make disciples of all the nations. And we pray that as individuals and as a congregation that we would take those charges very seriously and that we would do precisely what it is you've asked us to do. We pray that you'd be with us this morning as we conclude our time on vision and pray that your blessings would be upon us as we desire to do your will in the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, um, as I made reference, we've been talking about vision. And that, that's a very, very powerful thing because what you're doing with vision is you're, you're getting an idea of what could be. You're kind of capturing the imagination, the, the idea of something that is not yet, but that could be. I was born in 1967, and as such, I just barely predated the space age. But in 1969... America did something that was truly, truly remarkable. America went and put a man on the moon. So we on the video is John the F. Kennedy's speech about that when to to he spoke to the people. And do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. He was casting because the vision of what it is that we could do by putting a man on the moon, the not because it's easy, but because it was hard. If you go down into Orlando, Florida, you can see where another man by the name of Walt Disney had a vision. On the screen, what you're seeing is what Orlando used to be like. Orlando used to be a fairly rural part of America with swampland and agricultural stuff. And Walt took 22,000 acres just south of Orlando and converted it into one of the largest entertainment venues in the world ever in history. And that's the reason why Disney World exists. Now, in both of those instances, between Kennedy and and Disney, they both had vision. They both had an idea of what it was that it could be. Now, there's great news, and the great news is that you, you, were made for greatness. God made you For a purpose, He has the ability for you to do great things. And depending upon who it is that you ask, the definition of greatness may vary. If you ask a businessman what great is, he will say successful. If you ask what a politician what great is, he will say having power. A celebrity, it's probably going to be fame. Uh, For many people, it's going to be the accumulation of wealth. But if you were to ask Jesus what greatness is, He gave an altogether different answer. In Matthew 20, Jesus said, who wants to be great among you must be your servant. And he began to talk about this concept of being a servant and how it is that that causes greatness. He even evaluated himself and he said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And when you look at Jesus' life, it was in fact a life of service. He served God and he served others. When Jesus was asked what is the most important thing or the greatest thing in the, in the law, his answer was to love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, and the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Both of those involve service. 
We serve God and we serve others. And when we do, we are in fact being very Christ-like. God's desire is that we would be faithful servants. Now think about that for just a minute in regards to the role that you have within the church. And as you think about your role here in the church, you should evaluate whether or not uh, you operate as a faithful servant. And that's for you to evaluate. Many people, I have found church people, desire to be servants. They're just not entirely sure how they should go about doing that or what the opportunities are that await for him. Now, um, if we think about when we transition out of this world, when we go into heaven, there's a scene of that in Revelation chapter 22, and it talks about our role for all of eternity. And it says in Revelation 22 and verse 3, that after everything's all wrapped up here in creation, we go off to our eternal home with God in heaven, that His servants shall serve Him. So that, that, again, that is a primary reason why it is that we were made. So we serve God, we serve others. Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you are the light of the earth, you're the, you're the salt of the earth, the light of the world. He gives us the great commission in Matthew chapter 28 to go into the world and make disciples. All of these things talk about service, okay? So when we look at God's desire in this regard, I'd like to break down a few key concepts that we've been talking about over the last couple months And then I want to tell you what my vision is, what I kind of see as a great opportunity to accomplish things for God in the world. And I'll tell you, it doesn't just like involve me. It involves mostly you because there's a whole lot of personal opportunities that exist out there that I think will enable us to be light and salt and disciple makers. Okay, but I want to just emphasize to you, this is my vision. Your vision may be different. You may have a different idea. And what the goal here is, is to begin the dialogue. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about what what we see going. Um, So, first of all, I want to remind you that God expects you to serve other people. That's the expectation that God has given us. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul wrote to Timothy and said, It is he who saved us and chose us for his holy work. Okay, now that word, holy work, in your translation might be a little different. It might use the word ministry. Okay, because to minister simply means to serve. So when we talk about God's holy work, what we're talking about is the type of things, the type of works that God wants us to do. Again, you were created for a purpose, and that purpose is to be a light and salt and a disciple maker. Okay, that, is, that is our purpose here in the world. Have you considered the fact that God didn't have to leave you here in the world? After you obeyed the gospel and were saved, He could have translated you to heaven right away. But then you wouldn't have had the opportunity to be light in the, light in the world, salt in the world. You wouldn't have the opportunity to share the gospel with other people. Those are some of the reasons and purposes why it is that we are still here. You hear me use this expression about God's desire for us is that we would be useful and fruitful. That comes directly from Scripture. So Romans 7 verse 4 tells us that God's desire for us is that we might bear fruit for God. And that's, that's our job description. You know, we're, we're to bear fruit. And so one of the ways in which we do that is by serving other people. That is the way in which we, we bear fruit. So we were not saved in order to, to sit in you know, our, ourselves and do nothing. We were not saved to be spectators. We were not saved to be served. We were saved in order to serve. Okay? And then another key element. I want you to remember that God empowers us in order to serve others. And what I mean by empowers is we have abilities and gifts that we can use for this purpose. So we've talked about this already throughout the month. Romans 12 tells us that in His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. Okay, so there are a couple passages on gifting uh, in the Scripture. There's 1 Corinthians 12, talks about miraculous type spiritual gifts. There's Romans 12 that talks about what I call talent-oriented gifts. Miraculous gifts have faded away. They were fading even during the first century. When the canon was completed, those gifts went away. 
but talent-oriented gifts as spoken of in Romans 12 which seem to be very much a reality. Okay, so God has gifted us with various talents we can do. What makes it a spiritual talent or a spiritual gift? Using it for a spiritual purpose. So when we recognize that everybody's gifted, everybody's got a different skill set, I have no idea what yours is. Okay, so you can probably guess what mine is. Uh, I'm a public speaker. I, I do teaching fairly well. I would say that, that would be, that's my gift. I'll tell you, my gift is not song leading. Okay, the only time you want me as a song leader is if I'm the only guy in the room. <laughs> so that is, that is not my spiritual gift. But it may be your spiritual gift, um, whatever talent it is that you've got. Now, both of those gifts that I just referenced to, public speaking, uh, teaching, song leading, these are gifts that are kind of inwardly oriented, right? So that's a way in which we minister to one another here within the church. But of greater interest to me are outward-focused gifts, things that are available for people to use for a spiritual purpose to fulfill our role of reaching the lost. Remember, God has given each of you a gift. In 1 Peter 4, uh, Peter said, each of you has received a gift to use to serve others. So you can see the overlap between gifting and service, and we've got a role that we're to do. So if we use our talents and abilities in a way that is productive for being useful and fruitful for God, we got all the pieces working together, then we're in good shape. Now, one of the things that I really like are giving gifts. I, I, I truly enjoy it. I like Christmas because I like to be able to give gifts. Um, I, I've got a, a friend who's graduated from a, an educational program, and her graduation is today. And so I was jumped up and down and said, hooray, an opportunity to give a gift. Okay, I like gift giving. But I'll tell you that no matter how great your gift is and how appropriate and perfect it is for the recipient, that gift will be of little or no value at all if it remains unopened. If it just sits there wrapped up in paper looking pretty, it serves no real purpose. So likewise, if you have a gift or a talent, you need to unwrap it. Get it working. And more specifically, get it working for God. And again, I don't know what that gift might be for you, but I know that you've got something. It's likely not public speaking. It might be, but it likely isn't. Amazingly, a lot of people think that's the only gift that matters in a church. It's not. Okay, so uh, I always find it interesting that, that most people, their greatest fear is public speaking. That's the number one fear in, in, in the world, public speaking. Number two is the fear of death. Which, which is really peculiar to me because it means if you go to a funeral, more people would rather be the guy who's dead than the guy doing the eulogy because they're, they're afraid of public speaking, more so than death. So, so don't be thinking public speaking. I mean, it might be for you, but don't think, oh, that's it. It could be something a lot, lot, lot more benign. Okay, so whatever it is that you've got that's going on. So how can I, can I help you kind of figure out a little bit what that is? I can. Here's what I would ask you to just kind of consider. Think about your own life. Just do personal inventory and think, what do I like doing? What am I good at? Okay, th those are your talents. What do you like doing? And what are you good at? And you, you might get a little bit creative on this and start thinking, how can I use what I'm good at and what I like doing to achieve something for God? And again, in just a bit, I'm going to tell you precisely some ideas that will do that. But when you do that, when you're using what you like and what you're talented for and you have a passion for the Lord, that's going to end up with you having a very fulfilled life. And that's what God wants for you, right? So God wants you to have a very fulfilled life where you are useful and fruitful for God. Okay, And then number three, we need to remember that God equips us to serve Him. Okay, so one of our roles that we have as a church is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That's Ephesians 4. So it tells us there that God gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastor teachers in order to equip the saints for the work of ministry. 
which results in the building up of the body. Now, that might take place a couple different ways. One way that it might take place is bringing the body of Christ that already exists to a higher level of spiritual maturity. So 1 John 2 talks about differing levels of spiritual maturity. There are spiritual uh, children, there are spiritual young men, there are spiritual fathers. So as we progress and move in our spiritual life, that is building up as well. Or it may be building up numerically. And by that, what I mean is we bring more people to Christ who didn't used to be with Christ. We have unchurched people galore out there, and when we bring those people to the Lord, that builds up the body of Christ. So your ministry, whatever that might be, may be useful and fruitful in regards to building up the maturity of the saints who are already here or bringing in new saints that are not currently here. And I suspect that for most of us, our spiritual gifts and talents are going to be towards the latter, bringing lost people in to the Lord. Now, that might sound both exciting and scary at the same time for you, because now you might be starting to think, wow, he really does expect me to be involved in reaching the lost, and that is correct. But not because that's my view, but because that's God's view. That's part of our job description. It's part of the program that we signed up for. And so when you think about your role within the church, as the slide says, ask not what your church can do for you, ask what you can do for your church. What is my role here? What is it that I am accomplishing for God? Because God's desire is that you be a servant, that you serve the Lord in a productive and meaningful way. So here's what 1 Cor 15 says as he kind of closes up his teaching on the, on the resurrection. He says, throw yourself into the work of the master. Throw yourself into the work of God, confident that nothing you do for him is a waste of time. Okay, now, let me share with you my thoughts. And again, the goal here, I'm going to tell you what I'm thinking. You develop what it is that you're thinking. We'll have this great dialogue on that. We'll develop our congregational vision, and then we'll be off and running. Here's my thought. We have here in Orange County literally a million plus unchurched people. Now, we have more than that that are lost, that are not right with God. But I'm talking about the ones that are undisputably lost. They are unchurched. And here's what that is based on. If you ask people, hey, what is your religious affiliation? Here in Orange County, where we have 3.3 million people, 51% of them answer that survey by saying none. That's why I call them the nuns. Not like Catholic nuns, like N-O-N-E, none, okay? You ask them, what is your religious affiliation? None. 51% of the people, which means most of the people you interact with today, outside this building, out there in the world, will be unchurched, okay? Now... What do the unchurched think about their spiritual life? More than you might think. Okay, so again, other empirical research. You've seen this bazillions of time, but let me just kind of spend a little bit of time looking at this. Please notice that this was a survey that was given to unchurched people. Okay, so those 51% out there who you ask them, what is your religious affiliation? They answer none. And then the survey goes further. They asked them this question. If you were, how often do you wonder, if I were to die today, do I know for sure that I would go to heaven? A little less than half said never. They never think about that. One in five of them said that they weren't sure. And I can tell you that most pollsters will tell you that that answer usually means they just don't want to admit it. Okay, that, that the answer is true, they just don't want to admit it. But they answered, not sure. But then notice that a third of them, a third of them, said that they think about it at least once a month. One in ten said they think about it every single day. Every day. Okay, so that's about one and a half million people here in Orange County that if you were to ask them, do you, do you ever think about if you were to die today, am I sure I would go to heaven? One in three of those people will tell you that they think about it at least once a month. And one in ten will think about it every single day. 
So these are the people who are out there. So I give you that information so that you will know that the unchurched people out there are interested in their spiritual life. They just don't know what to do about that. And here's the problem. Popular media has convinced them that churches, Christians, us, are merely judgmental and hypocritical. And as a result of that, the chances of the guy who's in the shower in the morning thinking, you know, if I was to die today, I'm sure I would go to heaven. I'm not all sure about that. He's not going to come to a church because he's been heavily indoctrinated that churches are just hypocritical and judgmental. So how do you reach people that won't go to church? How do you reach them? Well, I'll tell you that I think that the key to that is to establish a meaningful relationship with unchurched people to where they can see that you are not just hypocritical and judgmental, but that you're a real person. And then that way, the unchurched people in the world will say, hey, you know, I thought these Christian people were all judgmental and hypocritical, but John over here doesn't seem to be that way at all. And then after a while, they might suddenly become a lot more comfortable with you. And since you would periodically talk about your spiritual life, they would then remember when they're in the shower. Hey, you know, I wonder if I was to die today, am I sure I'd go to heaven? I don't know. I'm sure not going to a church, though. Those people are full of hypocritical and judgmental folks. But there is John. I think he's a church guy. Maybe I could talk to John. And you know what? Eventually, the chances of that conversation happening are pretty good. So here's what I think should happen. I think what we need is we need saved people, Christian people, to be involved in stuff where they will interact with lost people so that they can build that relationship that will bring that person to the Lord. And by the way, if that sounds familiar, it's because when you look at Jesus' ministry, that's largely what his ministry was. Jesus didn't spend a lot of time in synagogues teaching and such. To reach lost people. He spent time on the streets talking to people. He just interacted with people at the water fountain, the woman at the well. So in our life, it's going to be largely the places that we interact with. So lost people, for the most part, are not going to come to a church setting because they're afraid of it. But there are other things that they will engage in. So on the screen, I can show you a bunch of stuff that lost people, unchurched people, do think about. Stuff is kind of like, well, you know, these are things that I, I, I would genuinely be interested in. I'd be genuinely interested in getting help with my kids' schoolwork. I'd be genuinely interested in maybe learning a new language or, or helping a needy child or receiving immigration assistance or just having a friend. So my thought in the way that I see this is that if we involve ourselves at an individual level, and let me pause for a minute and make this emphatic, I'm talking about personal ministries that people engage in, okay? What you engage in as just you. So if, if I, as an individual, say, well, I think I'm going to involve myself in something that enables other people to become a better parent, and lost unchurched people are engaged in that as well, then now we're in a context where we can interact with them. And if we're engaging in service in that regard, it's a fulfillment of the Galatians 6 rule. As you have opportunity, do good to everyone, especially those who are the household of faith. So you're able to do that. And as we interact with people and as we get to know them, then again, they realize that, you know, so Susan over here is not just a hypocritical, judgmental individual. She seems to be an okay person. Maybe I've been misinformed about what Christian people are like. John said, I've written these things to you that you may know you have eternal life. And so as your unchurched friends, your nuns, start realizing that they don't know it, but you periodically mention that you do know it, then they'll realize you have what they want. And if you've got a foundation of trust built there, you can talk to them meaningfully about their spiritual life. Now, let me tell you some real specific things that you might be able to do. You might be able to do foster care work. That might be taking in a foster child of your own. So maybe that's your spiritual gift, 
having compassion towards a needy child. Maybe it's helping somebody who's finishing the foster care system to transition into life and become an independent adult. Maybe that's it. Maybe you would recognize that there are lost people out there who know that their family life is a wreck. Their marriage is a disaster. Their parenting skills are horrid. And they could probably use some help for that. So they may not be going to look for a church, but they definitely might be going to look for something that will help them with parenting. If you're involved in something that involves people helping learn parenting skills, now you can interact with those people and create again a foundation upon which you can build. Maybe your spiritual gift is providing some professional service that's unique that other people also are looking for. Like on the screen is a picture of a pro bono legal clinic. I'll tell you that there are people in this congregation as the result of that type of outreach. Just Christian people that go do legal pro bono work. It creates a foundation where other people trust that person. They then explore their spiritual life and obey the gospel. Maybe there are people who are just lonely. I was amazed to learn not terribly long ago that one in three Americans, adults, say that they have no close friends. None. So those people are simply just looking for a friend, and you can be that friend. Although you're going to say, well, that's a spiritual gift. There are gaming groups that just get together once a week to play games. Maybe you'd like to play Monopoly. Maybe there's a lonely person out there that also likes to play Monopoly and is looking for a friend. That could be you. Over that game of Monopoly, you might develop the relationship that helps bring that person to the Lord. There are tons of people involved in addictive things. So there are ministry opportunities, organizations like Celebrate Recovery that relate to helping people overcome addictions or bad or abusive relationships or things like that. There are people whose financial lives are a wreck, just a disaster. And again, those people, when they're in the shower, after they're thinking, you know, I wonder if I was to die today, do I know for sure I'd go to heaven? Mm, Someday I'll have to look at that. But I definitely know that my finances are a disaster. I bet I could probably find some help with that. You might be that person. You know, maybe, maybe you could uh, lead a Dave Ramsey Financial Peace University group. You know, maybe something like that to enable you to do that. Maybe your skills are in languages. And there are people who are looking to learn English as a second language. Or I can give you the flip of that. Maybe you are an English speaker and you want to learn a foreign language. It's kind of like, well, I don't know. I would, I, maybe I wouldn't mind learning Farsi. Maybe I'd be okay learning Arabic. I've been thinking I needed to learn Pashto, whatever it might be. Maybe that's it. Maybe your ability would be, you know, I'm game to help somebody with their homework. Maybe a high school kid or whatever. Uh, You know, I'm good at chemistry. I can teach them that. I can do math. I can teach them that. You can do, you know, free tutoring to people who just need help with their homework. Maybe your thing is knitting or sewing You could form a knitting group or be involved in that. I I go to a Weight Watcher meeting every Saturday morning and a half for like 25 years. And I'll tell you that uh, myself and another member of the congregation here go to a group in Long Beach. And after about a year of a person sitting in front of us, the person finally turned around to us and said, where do you go to church? And we told her. And she said, because I hear you talk about church stuff all the time. And I'm looking for a church. It took a year to get to that point. Now, to give you encouragement of why I think this is the way we should go, this question was asked by a researcher who surveyed 77,000 people, so it's statistically significant, and asked this question to church people. What or who was responsible for your coming to Christ and your church? And the answers that they gave were very interesting. A special need, 1 to 2%. Walked in. It's like, oh, let's just go see what's going on here. Two to three percent. The pastor, we might think of that more broadly, the preacher, five to six percent. Now, it's interesting that a lot of church people think that's the primary one, but it's not. Five to six percent. Visitation, one to two percent. Sunday school program, four to five percent. They like, you know, they grew up in the church, their kid was in that environment, that's where they went. A religious crusade. Think Harvest Crusade, and you'll have it, 0.25%. You know why, by the way? Who goes to such things? Safe people do, okay? So lost people are going to stay away from that, judgmental, hypocritical, right? So they just don't go. So where do most people come to know Christ or the church? Well, think about you. 
Think about your own self. Was it a church program? Two to three percent. Was it a family member or friend? Almost certainly. 75 to 90 percent. So my vision is that we would be those friends. That you would take whatever talents, gifts, or abilities you've got and use them to create foundational friendships with unchurched people so that they trust you enough to talk about spiritual things that matter and you can bring them to the Lord. So if I was going to draw it out on a chart, it would look something like this. Who or what was responsible for bringing you to Christ in the church? So you've got a bunch of unchurched people out there and they don't know what's kind of going on, but they do know that they've got a bunch of other stuff that they're interested in foster care stuff, marriage and family, parenting, gaming, finding friends, financial stuff, legal needs, language stuff, time away from the kids, whatever, various things. And so my thought is that if Christian people personally, again, involve themselves in these various activities, as unchurched people involve themselves in that activity, you interact with them and create that relationship and then bring them to Christ in the church. That's my vision. And I think we can do it. But we all have to do it. So at the beginning of this, when I told you I was going to ask you to do something big, I meant it. We can't just let a million lost people enter into eternity. We, we need to reach them. And we can. And if you do, I'm confident you would have a very spiritually fulfilling life. So that's my thought. Share your thoughts. Let's get our discussion going and then put it into work. All right, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for our time here this morning that we've had to talk about our role here in the world. Not just today, but over the last month, as we've come to see very clearly your desire and expectation for us as your servants. And we pray that we wouldn't bury our talent, but that we would use our talent to bear fruit, much fruit, because we know that Jesus said, and this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. So we pray that we would do that. We just need to do our own evaluations as to what we are capable of doing and then do it. So we pray that we would have open hearts and open minds and open eyes to see the opportunities that are there and to truly be willing to let you use us as you see fit. Thank you for all your care. In Christ's name, amen. Oh, so these are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword, still we are the voice in the desert cry, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, He comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. So lift your voice, it's the year of jubilee, and out of Zion's hill salvation comes. These are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant David rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest. The fields are as white in the world. And we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. So lift your voice, it's the year of jubilee, and out of Zion's hill salvation comes. Behold, he comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet's call. So lift your voice, it's the year of jubilee, and out of Zion's hill salvation comes.
Well, I want to close us up with a couple of announcements. So first of all, I'll again remind you of the ability you have to send a keyword by text message to the number 94,000 on the screen for various things you might need. If you're new or visiting, text the word Orange View. If you'd like a copy of the bulletin, OV Weekly. If you'd like to pass something along to the church leadership or you have a prayer request of some kind, OV Com Card. If you're interested in becoming a child of God and obeying the gospel, OV I'm Ready. Just text that one word, all, no spaces, just one solid giant string of letters to that 94,000 and that will bounce that information back to you. Um, on the last one about becoming a Christian, there are lots of avenues for that. That's just one of them. You can also talk to any member here. Any member here can help you with that. Or you can certainly come talk to me. So I'll be around the church campus throughout the day too. I'd be happy to certainly talk to you. So uh, exciting week. Our new uh, evangelist, uh, Kevin Williams, will be here later this week. So he arrives in town on Wednesday or so. Um, and next Sunday will be his first Sunday here. Now a brief footnote on that. Um, this will be next month will also be my last month here for a while because I got activated for a military assignment and I'm going to the Middle East. So while I'm gone, he, he will be here uh, filling the preaching roles and such uh, entirely. When I get back, we will share those responsibilities. But uh, two things related to his, his arrival. So one is we've had difficulty finding him somewhere to live and we would rather him not be homeless. So here's what we have a, have a need for. Um, housing is going to open up for him sometime in June or July, okay, because that's when school's out, people start moving around, there'll be a lot more housing opportunities, but it's very low right now. So we need somewhere to house him for about four to six weeks. So if you have a spare bedroom at your home that you can open up for him during that time, that would be terrific. Um, if, if not... He's likely going to end up on my sofa at my house for that period of time, which is fine for me, and he's okay with that too. But again, if we have uh, the ability to do something a little bit better for him, that would be more gooder. Okay, So if you're able to do that, please see me like right away because he's going to be on ground here on Wednesday. Okay, So please let me know. Um, then the first Sunday he's here, which will be next Sunday, we'll have a congregational meal. We have a sign-up sheet for that and a text message and email that went out for that. So that'll be next Sunday right after services as well. So looking forward to his arrival. And then on the subject of potlucks, at the end of the month, we'll have another one uh, for two events. One is a graduation celebration for our graduates. We have three graduates here in the congregation. So we'll have a graduation event for them. And then it'll be my goodbye because I'll be gone, uh, like I said, for about a year after that point. So I'll be back in March or April of next year. So it'll be my time to wave goodbye, high fives to our graduates, so that'll be at the end of the month. So you'll be well fed this month. Okay, you got at least two meals covered. Um, then also just to remind you as well of what our Bible study options are, we have three that go on during the week. We have an online study on Tuesday nights at 6.30 on the Ten Commandments, dealing with parenting this week. We have a study in the life and ministry of Jesus live here at the church campus Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m., and then we have a ladies' Bible study group Thursday mornings at 10 a.m. as well. One late arrival prayer request that uh, just came in uh, late last night or early this morning, and that is that Monica is uh, in the hospital right now. So she's had issues with nausea and vomiting now for like several weeks, and they determined that she's got a, a need for a gastroenterologist, and so they admitted her to the hospital to receive treatment on that. So please keep her in your prayers, and if you have other prayer requests, you can send them to me. Uh, these cards, like the ones I referred to during the sermon, we have lots of those printed up that you're able to distribute. So if you'd like some of those, just come see me and I will give you as many as you would like. You can just spread them everywhere. It's no voice necessary evangelistic outreach. Just distribute them like everywhere imaginable. Uh, we do get about 10 studies a month out of that. So if you're able to do that, that would be great. But let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and we'll close up our time for this morning. Lord, thank you again for our time that we've had to be together as a congregation and to spend time in your word and then time in worship and time in song and prayer and uh, remembrance of the Lord's Supper. And, and we pray that everything that we've done has been in accordance to your will and in accordance to your word. We pray your blessings upon us as we leave this place to go back out into that world. We know that we're going to interact with lost people while we're there, and we pray that we would have open eyes to see that and the opportunities to reach them for you. Thank you for all your care. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you so much. Have a joyous week.